Hello everyone! Welcome to Be Well Clinic channel. I'm Amy Mahali and I'm really glad that you are here today. We're just going to chat about things for a minute or two to have anyone join us that is planning to join so they don't miss the beginning, but I'm very excited to um, be talking about this topic tonight. So, we are talking, just in case you wandered into the wrong classroom, <laughs> we are talking about the nutritional density of food. This is a super important topic because we, well, for multiple reasons, but one of the things, it's it's an important thing to learn about because most of us did not learn anything about it in school, um, from any you know, health class, or even uh, from a lot of uh, nutritional practitioners because, um, well, because of things that I'll get to in a second. I don't want to jump too far ahead. So some housekeeping things or uh, welcome to YouTube if you're not familiar with this. Um, there is a live chat that you can join in um, and be chatting and commenting with each other or um, asking questions to me. I can see that it comes here on the side of my computer um, so I can watch it on my screen and answer questions that you have. That's the way you can interact if there's a question you have from what I'm saying. Otherwise, you can um, type it on the comments later if you're watching this video on replay, for example, or you just don't want to um, log in. You don't need a YouTube account to jump into live chat. It's just a Google account. Um, so you would just click on there, start typing a comment. It would tell you to log in, and you just log in with, a, uh, with your normal Google account. So that's the way you can jump in and ask questions. So, um, awesome for people joining us live. Thanks for being here. I appreciate you supporting me in the moment so I actually get on and teach these things. And I am also happy for all the people who watch this on a replay. Okay, we are um, going to talk about nutritional density of food today. And there were some questions that I put into the description of the various event um, blurbs that brought you here. Those questions are what things that I said will be answered today. Um, what questions you need to research or know what type of food. So if you're asking or researching, asking a farmer or researching in a store about a brand, what are the things you're looking for in different food? And we're going to talk about different types of food, meaning meat products and eggs and vegetables. So um, that is on the plan also. Um, number two question, how to know the density of your food? So basically what conditions will make food more dense when it's grown and when you eat it as opposed to food that is going to be grown as less dense food? And we'll talk about what that means as well. Question number three, what benefits you can expect if you are eating nutritional dense food? One of the things that is true about nutritionally dense food is it generally costs more money. Um, so there's a lot of mm, caution that people may have as they are very responsibly watching their budget and not extraordinarily spending money. It is important to understand the added benefit that you do get when you spend more money on more quality food um, as opposed to the other way around. So um, we will talk about that as well. Um, and let's get started. I'm just writing myself a note so I don't forget to say something. <clears throat> okay. No questions yet, which is fine, because what have we talked about yet? If there's something that you <clears throat> hope that I get to or something that uh, strikes a, a thought as I'm talking, please put it in. I am very easily interruptible. It doesn't bother me. Um, to stop my train of thought and come back to it or just go in a whole new direction for a little bit or swing it back around. That is not a, a stressor to me. So ask when you want to. Okay. Those are the questions answered. There are a few things that I thought of that are important to set up kind of as a backdrop when we look at food. Number one, we were all taught that calories equals input, right? Calories equals energy. And if you have more calories in than calories out, you gain weight. And if you have less calories in than calories out, you lose weight, right? Well, it's what we were taught. It's right that that's what we were taught, but it is not correct. That is not how it works, actually. Um, how it works is 
nutrition. Calories are energy, but there are other energetic, mm, there are substances that give us energy otherwise as well. Um, but the thing that makes our body work, not energized, but work, are nutritional building blocks. I talk about these a lot because um, I talk about having the right building blocks for your immune system, having the right building blocks for regenerating cells. When we are coming out of an illness, long or short, we need to regenerate new healed cells, either immune cells or if you twisted your ankle, you need new collagen cells, right? Any, any healing or progress um, it's going to require new cells. And when that doesn't happen, then we have pain and swelling, disuse, low muscle tone, those types of things. What are the building blocks? Nutrition. There are macros, which are carbs, um, proteins, and fats. And then there are micros, which are, I'm not a nutritionalist, so I think that's what they're called, which are vitamin A, B, C, D, blah, blah, blah. Um, they are minerals, trace minerals, more commonly found minerals like calcium and magnesium. So these are what our cells and the proteins and the DNA structure that tell our cells and our phospholipid membrane and the little organelles inside our body, inside each cell, and the hormones that we produce and the immune cells that we make and on and on and on, those are made from building blocks. And then we give them energy in form of ketones or in form of fructose or uh, glucose. Um, which we get from carbohydrates. Ketones come from fat. Um, so those are our main energy sources. But do you understand how we also need the structure <laughs> for the energy to come into? When we eat calories in equals calories out, we are only paying attention to the energy input to the gas in your car. And we're not paying any attention to, do you have an engine? <laughs> Does, is your muffler falling off? Is your... Um, frame so bent in that the wheel is rubbing, right? So those are things that have to be addressed also. And that when I'm talking about nutritionally dense food, that is what I'm talking about. We can get calories, we can get ketones from a lot. Um, they come as you eat the nutrients that you need for your body. Great. So how do we know what to eat? I believe that naturally, um, we and, and little kids, We'll have this. I believe that naturally we're born like all other people. No, I'm sorry, not people, but also animals. Because um, we are, we're a mammal, right? So all other mammals also have this. Um, where we are born with a sense of being able to smell um, and decide what it is that we want to eat or not eat. Dogs, horses, cats, these animals are much more known for. We understand that they do that. Dogs won't eat certain things or they'll go eat a piece of grass when they're sick, right? They just naturally seem to know what to do to give their body when they're not feeling well. I believe that we have the ability to do that as well. We have a lot of societal messages in coming at us that tell us we can't, um, to tell us not to listen. Basically, they tell us not to listen. So think about as you were a kid, you would eat food. You didn't worry about how many calories it had um, or, you know, were you eating too much? Were you going to get fat? The plan is eat food and grow. Right? Um, so that would be a functional, much more functional relationship with food. Um, when we get to an adult, we go, it's not mealtime, I can't eat, or those aren't the healthy carbs I should be eating. Um, I definitely need a salad when you really just want a steak. Okay, so we have shut off our, our intuition about food systematically because we are told that it's the right thing to do. So step number one, as we start exploring what food is nutritionally dense and what food does our body want, we want to start giving credence to what our body is saying. I call this letting your body be a speaking partner in the relationship instead of a silent partner, where you say, that's very nice, but no, you know, I know better. I'm not listening. We have to follow the meal times, or we have to go to sleep at 10, or we have to get up at 5.30. You know, we, we have so many things that we regiment. We sleep when we're not, we don't sleep when we are tired. We get up when we're still tired. We eat when we don't want to sometimes at mealtimes or we don't eat when we do want to between mealtimes. So starting to get into touch with listening to your body is a part of it. That's another background thing. Um, I love the opportunity that new parents have to teach their kids this. 
because kids haven't heard the societal pressures yet. They've not been taught how to regulate their body's directive and, and, and suggestion or asking for certain things because I kind of left this out. You may have in, uh, gleaned it already, but the body asks for the nutrition it wants. If you need some calcium, your body knows foods that contain calcium and it will crave those foods for you and ask you to eat them so it can have what it needs to function, to build, to do a metabolic process, whatever is going on. So as we turn off our body's ability to listen um, ourselves, like I just described, or as our own imbalanced gut and body microbial flora turns off um, or clouds our signals to our body, um, meaning like yeast candida will often crave a high carbohydrate diet. That's because that's what they like. Um, and if they are craving a high carbohydrate diet, that, that would be louder. They, they trick your taste buds or your body, quote body, to ask for that specific thing. So when that happens, when we get to that, our own flora kind of, uh, I don't say betrays us, that's strong, but it, it overrides what we need in our own body signal, and it overrides to another organism that <clears throat> is living in our body and being supported by us um, and the food that we eat. So we can consciously turn off our listening to the body signals. We can also have a signals overridden by other signals like microbes. Um, and then there's lots of other things we can do. Unhealthy cells will send improper signals. If we are very boggy and sad, we will try to do things like cheer us up, which means eating certain foods, especially carbohydrates or dairy products. So all those different things come because of the state that your body is in. Your body's just trying to do the best it can. But when we know that, we can walk backwards and we can help our body be cleaned up. So we are listening to the signals. We can help our body um, by believing it and, and uh, evaluating to begin with, but believing it of what is it asking for? As Dr. Natasha with the GAPS diet, she says, what would you kill for right now? Um, and I love that idea because it's it takes it up the passion step. This is not, I guess I could tolerate eating, right? This is, what do you want to eat? What is the food that your body is craving? And when we get to nutritional density, your body will crave a nutritionally dense food. I don't know if any of you have had experience with beet kvass. Um, beet kvass, thank you guys. I just saw two people's comments. Um, glad that that was helpful. Beet kvass is a very dense food. It is very strong of a liver tonic with fermented beets, tons of bacteria, probiotics, tons of just strength and um, nutrition. There's a lot of B vitamins in beets. Everything, when you ferment it, everything is much stronger, um, much more flavorful, uh, much more bioavailable nutrition when you ferment things than when they are in their raw state. So when we ferment things, like beet kvass, plus we add a lot of salt, plus the probiotics. So this is a very dense food. And a lot of people, when they start drinking it, don't love it. But usually if you stick with it for a couple weeks, it becomes a very delicious food that your body will crave. People tell me that all the time. I didn't like it. And then after a couple of weeks, I started craving it and I love it. That is what our body is doing when we have a nutrient dense food that we want to eat. Beautiful for that. So, as we look at nutrient dense foods, oh, babies, let's go back to babies. So as a new parent, you have an incredible opportunity to teach your child what you are now trying to learn as an adult. Um, the eating of food with your five senses. So I want to, to jump with that. So one of, what would you like me to put in the live chat for spelling? Beet kvass? Ah, yes, probably beet kvass. Beet kvass. And I do have a blog post with a recipe for that. So easy. It's beet, salt, and water. You ferment it for five days. But that is how you spell beet kvass. It is a lovely, lovely beverage. Liver tonic. Okay, perfect. Um, so as we look at what our body is asking for and what our child has. So five senses. This is one of the things I wrote under the let's answer the question how to know the density of your food. There are certain growing practices we're going to talk about. Um, big picture so you can understand what to look for and why that's what it is because I'm passionate about why, not just a list of things. 
The other part of that, besides the academic thought, um, would be what does your body say? What does it taste like? So what are the five senses? Smell, taste, touch, feel, and sound. Right? So when you eat something that's dense, have you guys ever experienced eating lettuce like an iceberg lettuce, right? Tastes like water, tastes like nothing. And then we pick lettuce from our yard and you eat it. And the the intensity of the taste, you never realize lettuce actually tasted like something. Um, even red leaf lettuce in the store is totally different from iceberg, right? The taste of a vegetable or a fruit or a meat is nutrition. You are tasting the building box, the quality of that food, um, and it's absolutely beautiful. So that is one of the things that we can know the density of food. <clears throat> As a baby is eating new foods, they are getting all over their face. They're hearing it, right? They splash on their tray. Um, they are smelling it. They are tasting it. And then eventually they eat it. <laughs> Um, so they use all five of their senses when we let them be messy. And that is very important because their body learns good food, what nutrition those foods contain. In a, uh, for most people, hopefully in a good situation, in a safe place where they are getting food from mom's milk still, right? We're just weaning. It's a weaning diet. So they are getting their nutrition and they're playing with their food. Food is for fun. And they get to learn all about this, they get a good relationship with food. Um, both emotionally, hopefully, um, is the plan. And then they're getting a good relationship sensorily with food because um, that is allowing you to, um, it's allowing them to learn and their body to learn what, what is it that I am, am going to ask for. Okay, we can do that as adults as well. Take time. When you're eating your food, stop. Taste it. Smell it. Think about it. Um, when you pick an apple, um, so one of the things that someone taught me is you flick apples in the store and if they're sounding really, if they're dull, they're kind of like, um, like red delicious apples, right? They're, they're more mushy inside. Well, if you're getting a Fuji apple, that's not supposed to be mushy. So a more crisp kind of sound is that. Think about bread. We know it's good bread, right? When there's a crackle and um, chefs talk about that. So there is a sound to food that we can learn, usually when we're getting it in its whole state. We want to look at the food. Color matters. Color means there's different, there's different nutrition. That's why yellow beets are different from red beets. Or it means there is enough nutrition. Iceberg lettuce, coincidentally, is very colorless. Um, whereas kale, which is much more dense in calcium and magnesium and um, other things that slip my mind right now is a much darker green, right? Green leafy vegetables we know contain a lot more nutrition than a lettuce does. Mm -hmm. So there is something to color, the vibrancy, the health of that food. So these are things with your own senses that you can tell when you look at food. What is that um, food like? Um, you will get some idea of how it's grown. Tomatoes that are not red don't taste very good, right? So taste comes in there and that proves what you saw. That's a real thing. You're not just being a like picky tomato eater. There is a density, a nutritional density or a ripeness or availability of nutrients that is not available when that tomato is pretty much orange or you know so mushy, right? So let me just confirm for you, there are different qualities of foods and the things that you love, the things you want, that really high quality, those blueberries that are just decadent and like candy, those are more nutrient dense. They are better. You are not just being a snob and you should just eat the other food because it just tastes worse. Taste is your body's acknowledgement or in the food's acknowledgement that it is good and it is giving you more good things. So, so fun. I love that. Okay. Oh, I already said that sidebar. Good. Okay. Um, next. In this next section, I want to say I am not a farmer. There are very deep concepts which I love to listen to, and I will be able to skim the surface of um, explaining to you in the kind of high, hopefully, in the kind of high level that I'm overarching putting them onto my thought about food density um, in terms of soil, how the food are grown, things like that. But I am not an expert. I am not a farmer. I do not study this. Um, so I just want to make that caveat, <laughs> and you can go in and study this so much more deeply. 
Um, one of the books that I love is called Empty Harvest. And this is by Mark Anderson and Dr. Bernard Jensen. Um, I think it's available on Amazon also, but it's also available on Selene River Press, which I will link in this description after the video reposts. Actually, I can put it in live chat right now because I have it pulled up. Um, I actually have a, another book pulled up that's called Put Your Money Where Your Mouth Is. That's what this link will take you to. Um, but on this website is the Empty Harvest book is available as well. Oh, don't want to open Zoom. Sorry. Just trying to find you guys again. Um, so when we... You guys should be able to see the live chat, even if you're not logged in, you should be able to copy and paste that, hopefully. Um, you can, if you can't see live chat right now, like on your phone, if you look underneath where it says save, share, all that, there's a button that says live chat. That's where you can find the chat for this video. Um, I'm not sure where it is on a monitor because I've not watched a live chat on a computer before. I usually watch them on my phone if I watch them. Okay, here's Lean River Press, Empty Harvest. Um, he is working, um, it's just great, but it really is talking about the ecosystem of the, the world, um, the nutritional density, why soil is so important. Um, so the really deeper concepts, the information that I briefly talk about is in this book. All right, let's talk about soil. But before we talk about soil, we're going to talk about terrain theory. <laughs> terrain theory is my favorite. Terrain theory is a expansion on the very well-known germ theory of, of uh, pasture, right? So here's my book, Pasture, Bichamper Pasture. Um, this is a great, this is a great book because it talks about what happened. These two gentlemen um, were 30, 40 years apart in age, but they both studied at the same time. Pasture, we know, germ theory. Um, disease is caused by the bacteria that gets in your body and makes you sick, right? So we kill the bacteria and we get better. The problem with that is Pasteur believed that the body was sterile and all bacteria cause disease and sterilizing everything would cause health. What we now know clearly with the microbiome is that's not true. We know that we have to have and we do have microbes, tons of microbes. I'm reading another book called The Epidemic of Absence, and they talk in that book about how they did actually succeed in making mice sterile, but there was, they ate tons of carbohydrates. Um, they needed four times, I think, the caloric intake, if I remember right, of uh, another rat um, to maintain life. Um, they just, they weren't healthy. And what's cool is you could reverse it when they put the microbia back in. They started introducing probiotics basically to the mice or the rats, whichever it was. They started changing and perking back up and getting healthy again. So we, just like them, we can't be sterile. We're up to 90% other DNA besides our own. Tons of microbes live in the shell of our body and work symbiotically with them, um, with our body when they're kept in balance and check with the immune system. When we have something that's really broken, um, meaning the terrain, terrain meaning landscape, right? Terrain theory says the germ is a factor, but it, it, if it comes into a healthy body, a healthy system, it doesn't have a place. It's not needed um, to change or um, it's not able to kind of take root because there's a great lawn. You can't, weeds don't grow in a really nice lawn, right? That's what terrain theory is. Terrain theory also looks at, I forgot it. We'll come back to it. Um, so that's terrain theory. It's a really nice lawn. And if you keep the lawn nice and watered and thick grass, then you don't have to go weed all the time because the weeds don't really grow very much. Um, if at all. So that's the, the idea of terrain theory. When we look at our soil, terrain theory pulls in perfectly because soil is also supposed to be alive. And when we put modern farming practices, which are telling um, us to use pesticides and herbicides, um, we kill the soil. We kill the microbes in the soil. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Number one, pesticides, herbicides, organic, non-organic, What's the difference? A lot of people think that organic means no pesticides or herbicides, and that is not true. 
Um, sometimes that may be true, but organic just means they are allowed to use some herbicides, but not other ones. So there are specific herbicides and pesticides that have really harmful chemicals that somehow is okay to use, but we know it's not good to use. Anyway, that's a whole other debate for another day. We, that is looking only at the chemicals coming into our body. So when you buy organic, it is good. It's better than buying conventional because it is putting, um, it is putting less chemicals into your body. That's a good plan. The problem is if you buy something with an organic pesticide or herbicide and that organic pesticide kills the microbial bugs, right? The microbia um, living in the soil, we now don't have live soil. So let's talk about what happens or why we need live soil. This book, Empty Harvest, is talking about um, uh, the, the, the way they walk into this is to say, when you have something that lies in the soil or lies in the forest, what happens? It decomposes. So there are bacteria and fungus and yeast that decompose things. They break down the structure into pieces. So those pieces are available in the soil, right? We need nitrogen in the soil. We need calcium, phosphorus. So that comes into the soil because we break it down. Perfect. We do need that. So number one reason we need live soil is because we need to break down things. So the nutrients are small things instead of an apple rind that never breaks down because there's no bacteria or enzymes to break it down. Right? So number one, live soil will give us more nutrition because it's being broken down and quote digested, right? Kind of like we do. Number two reason, if you have roots in the soil, do they break down? No, they don't. They stay well. They don't get eaten up by the microbia of the, um, of the soil, right? Why is that? That is because there is a fungus called, I will spell this. I listened to the Google, like, uh, you know, how to say it. And let me see if I can say it. But first, let me spell it. Oops, I spelled it wrong. Let me see. It's a I in the wrong place. Okay, that is the correct spelling. The second one's the correct spelling. So mycorrhiza, 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 mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae. I think that's how she said it. Mycorrhizae. We're gonna go with that. So mycorrhizae is a fungus that lives on the roots, all the micro roots and the roots of the uh, plant. They're in the soil. They create, listen to this, a toxic substance, like an antibiotic, that prevents the bacteria from breaking down the roots. Sound familiar? What other yeast gives us a antibiotic? Penicillin, right? This is the same type of thing that, the, that happens in that yeast. There are so many natural antibiotics in our world. Um, and they have so many different goals. So when we kill everything in the soil, when we kill with a pesticide um, or an herbicide just because of the chemicals, right? Our body can take a lot of chemicals because we are big. A little tiny body of a microbe um, can't take a lot of chemicals, even if it's not specifically designed to kill that microbe, right? So, um, okay, so we have microbes dying in the soil. We have the my mycorrhizae. Microia, I don't know, I lost it. Um, and we have other bacteria that breaks down the stuff. So bacteria breaks down the stuff, mycoria protects the roots. So now we have nutrition available, live roots that help it to maintain. And then there are other enzymes and other things that live along um, the plant roots that help it to absorb. Excuse me. We also interestingly need minerals too, and we need a proper mineral balance. You gardeners probably know this better than me, I'm learning, um, but we need a proper mineral balance to be able to have the, the pH and the conditions mineral wise of the soil to be in the right place to absorb food. Interestingly enough, the same range of mineral balance that our own body needs. So cool, so cool. Okay, so when we put herbicides, pesticides, organic or not, in our soil, we have the potential, the very likely potential, to be killing that. Um, 
I watched a mini movie. Uh, it's on YouTube, a documentary probably is there called Banana Republic. It's very interesting. It's also very, I don't want to say political, but it, it doesn't just talk about bananas. It talks about the whole culture, the whole, um, there's a lot of gang protection, government involvement, bad, you know, under the table paying off gang member. It's just bad. It's a, it's a big business and it's not great. Anyway, one of the things they talked about in that is the banana. So bananas have to be farmed um, in a specific kind because every banana needs a different processing. That's why we all have one kind of banana in the store. Um, organic, smaller organic farms um, have the same kind of practices, but their bananas are different because most bananas are being overgrown by a fungus because the soil is imbalanced. Whereas an organic farmer who doesn't spray the heavy amounts of pesticides um, and more every day, because now there's a fungus they have to kill. Um, these ones are, they don't have the problem with fungus. So this farmer was talking about that. It's exactly what we're talking about here. There is, just like in our own body, killing the body doesn't work. Sterility doesn't work. Not only can we not absorb food, but we are now ripe for an infection. It's like plowing your field or stripping the grass off your field and then expecting it to stay dirt. Like, that's ridiculous. We all know that's not going to happen. There will be dandelions in there next year. <laughs> There's absolutely no way that you are going to leave something bare. Um, so that's what germ theory is, is like, if it's bare, it's better. Um, terrain theory says, no, you need to cultivate the right environment with minerals and vitamins and water and pH level um, so that the terrain of our body, the terrain of the soil we grow food in is ideal for absorbing nutrition so that it can Nutri nutrientize the plant and when it pulls all that nutrition into the plant now we can eat it and now we have a nutrient dense food okay um can dead or herbicide soil contribute to leaky gut yes it can because those chemicals can kill our own flora just like uh, chlorine kills flora right so in water to kill bacteria um it also contributes to leaky gut, so directly contributes because it's a chemical that kills things. So yes, very good. Um, and there's a lot of study, the whole, a lot of what people are looking at with glyphosate um, in Roundup probably has to do with, with that specifically. The other side of it would be if you are nutriently deficient in your diet and you don't have the building blocks to maintain proper cell junctions and healthy cells that reproduce correctly and at a good speed, you also will have leaky gut eventually because you just can't build the wall fast enough. Um, that membrane gets leaky and holy and broken down just because you literally don't have enough building blocks for it. So yes, it definitely contributes to that. Interesting fact about herbicides and pesticides and chemicals in general, we did not use any of them until World War II. One, two. I can't remember if it's one or two. That's when we made them, right? We made herbicides and pesticides for the war, for chemical warfare. And then they found either some benefits from spraying mustard gas on things and what it did to the, like, the fauna, fauna, flora, flora, fauna's animals, what it did to the flora. Um, also, those companies needed a place to put the thing that they were manufacturing. Um, so everything that was eaten before World War I, to be safe, everything that was eaten before World War I was organic. It did not have chemicals. And generationally, so that brings up a really nice point with this book. You guys know that I like books. <laughs> okay, Pottinger's Cats. Um, this is a study in nutrition, as it says. So uh, Francis Pottinger published this. He, it was a 10 year study they did in 1932 to 1942. This was the time of vitamins, man. Um, Dr. Royal Lee, Dr. Weston A. Price. This was when our world shifted to foods of modern commerce as a, uh, that's what Dr. Price, Weston A. Price calls it, foods of modern commerce. Um, processed grains, processed flour, as opposed to a traditional diet in the place that you live. And it would also started bringing foods in, commerce foods, right, as opposed to just eating what locally is what your body's been used to eating, what generationally has been used to eating, used to preparing, knowing that you have to use good practices because if you don't, you don't reproduce. Um, and that's really what Pottinger's cats comes to. They studied cats. They gave them foods that are not right for them. So cats should eat raw milk and raw meat. 
Um, that's their, you know, two major food groups. So they did different studies of some cats with raw milk and cooked meat, some cats with cooked and cooked, some cats with um, raw and raw, right? And they studied the differences. And what they came to was there were different health issues that came first generation, second and third, which by the way, mirror coincidentally, <laughs> obviously, obviously not. Um, they mirror what we're seeing. So the first generation had heart disease. Um, I can't remember if they had cancers in there or not. Second generation started having hormone imbalance. Um, there was a, uh, the, the sexes stopped being as differentiated. Um, and we started seeing uh, homosexual tendencies and just like the, the females got really aggressive and the males got really passive. And um, so there's all these different hormonal imbalances that got really off. And then there's trouble with trouble with reproducing. Some of those second generation had some deformities or would have like a weak heart, um, more congenitally. They had congenital issues. Whereas the first generation ate a normal diet until they didn't. So they had a certain set of symptoms. The second generation had more congenital issues of deficiencies. Um, and then the third generation, if there was one, because there's a lot of infertility, um, had complete infertility. There was no fourth generation at all. And very few of those third generation cats lived past six months when they were fed fully in a cooked and pasteurized diet. Again, it's because it's wrong for the cat. I'm not saying we all have to eat raw meat. It's because a cat is supposed to eat those foods. So when it's not able to get the nutrition out, we see a progression and it is a demonstrable, right? That's science, demonstrable, reproducible, scientific study. When we see that and we see it patterned over and over, we can with certainty say there is a correlation, there is a connection, and this does have to do with nutrition when you're looking at the studies that there is. Um, now, there's lots of reasons why we don't get nutrition. One, the soil grows poor nutrition food because we've killed it. Number two, um, we can't absorb the nutrition because we don't have good flora, just like the root systems, right? We don't have good flora in our gut to help us absorb the food. We don't have a strong enough enzyme activity, for example, because we're deficient in building blocks to make enzymes. We don't have enough hydrochloric acid because we have zinc deficiency. So all of these things are present potentially, and that's going to hinder our absorption of food, even if you eat the very best food. Now, the very best food would be better because the best food would give you more available nutrition. So even if you only get a portion of it, you'll get more than if you get a portion of a, a poor food quality. Okay. Now I want to pull back around to um, why do we eat more dense food? Kind of that budget question. Why would I buy a chicken that costs $30? Because that's truly how much it costs to raise a chicken that is good. $30. Why would I buy a chicken at $30 when I can get one for four? That's a great question. Um, why would I buy grass-fed beef when I can get the other kind of hamburger, right? Why would I, et cetera, et cetera. Um, vegetables, the disparity of organic and not organic is not very big, um, but some people do buy non-organic, even though, you know, it's, it's a dollar more for the organic, right? So sometimes, and sometimes there is a reality of budget. So we're going to talk about how to prioritize that here in a minute. Um, to help you know, like, what's the, if you only do truly have limited money to spend, um, what are the best things to look for? What's the biggest bang for your buck? Okay. When we come back to that idea, um, what will happen if you eat a chicken that is more nutritionally dense? This is why that calorie versus nutrition concept is in. Because if calories are calories, it would make sense to eat the cheaper thing even if it's a bread, right? Because if calories are all we're after, you should eat bread and not an expensive $30 chicken. Duh, right? You guys aren't stupid. But the problem is, and why all America thinks that way is because we were taught that was true and it's not true. It's not true that calories equal health or calories equal your weight, which is apparently the very pinnacle of health, right? Perfect weight, perfect health. False, so false. When we look at nutritional density, your body being supplied with all the building blocks that it needs to maintain a healthy and efficient body system, you will eat less food if it is more nutritionally dense. Does that make sense? Hopefully, yes. You will eat less of portions if you eat more dense food. Now, at first, you probably won't. At first, you will probably eat more food because your body is starving and it's like, oh, thank goodness, here is some nutrition. <laughs> 
Um, but that usually lasts a month or less. Um, I've had kids, two-year-old kids that ate four pounds of meat a day for a month. And then they went back to a normal two-year-old portion. Right? So that little kid's body was healing from a significant eczema and needed a ton of nutrition to rebuild all of the cells. Needed a lot of amino acids, a lot of connective tissue, um, a lot of you know, collagen and vitamin C and all those nutrients that formed connective tissue. So he ate a lot of it. And then he stopped when his body stopped. You will not overeat food if you are eating nutritionally dense food. We will store extra calories as fat because we don't need it. But we may need it later. Um, it also depends on the state in which you eat. If you eat in a stressed state, your body says, store this, famine is coming. If you eat in a relaxed state, even a piece of cake, and you are not stressed about it or feeling guilty about it, there's scientific research, your body will store it differently if you are enjoying your cake than if you are stressed and guilty about eating a piece of cake. So if you are going to eat cake, enjoy it. Um, but think most about what nutrition am I eating? And then people ask me all the time, well, can I have pizza sometimes? Sure. But don't think of it as nutritionally dense, right? If we're eating for nutrition, excuse me. Um, I don't know how something just got in my eye, but it did. Okay. Um, when we are eating for nutrition, that's good. When you are eating food for fun, that is something else. So don't stress about it. It will be fun um, and move on. Um, but if you are eating for nutrition, most of your diet should be eating for nutrition. And nutritious food tastes so good. Um, have you been to a, a steakhouse where you got a really good steak and you are sad that there's sauce on it? Like you don't need sauce. You don't need salt almost. You don't even need pepper because the meat itself or the vegetable itself tastes so good and rich and nutritional full. I hope that you guys have experienced that. If not, I, I really want you to <laughs> try to find some really good quality something based on the rules we're going to talk about. Um, or I don't know, I can't cook you all meals, but I want to, my heart is to get some really good food and cook you something, sit down, listen to it, enjoy it. Um, I teach a lot in my meat stock classes, how you can tell the the cleanliness or the quality of chicken or beef um, when you do a meat stock and you skim the scum. So there are things like that um, that help you know the quality and you yourself can determine with, I guess, the scientific method, right? Observable, repeatable, demonstrable, hypothesis, um, all of that type of thing. You can figure out what it is that's good. The other thing is something that is good to you is something that your body wants. Example. I usually am a meat girl. I have a lot of rebuilding that I've needed to do from years of my gut not absorbing nutrition very well and from years of my, um, well, and then doing GAPS diet, which started healing things. But I needed a lot of, a lot of animal products, which is the most dense um, building blocks. So a lot of animal products, a lot of meat. Like I could easily go a few weeks with only eating sauerkraut as a vegetable. Like everything else is just meat or dairy or fat. So this is my normal state um, just because I'm listening to my body, not because I'm particularly shooting for something. There was one day I was starving, like pit in my stomach. You're eating food and it's like you didn't eat anything, but your stomach is stretched. You guys experience that? That is because you're eating the wrong thing. You're not eating the nutrition your body wants because when you get the nutrition that your body wants, it will shut off the hunger because it doesn't need the input. It is asking you for something. So I finally stopped after eating, I don't know what, we'll just make up, it was a lot. A steak, half a, half a pound of cheese, like, you know, just a couple eggs. Like I just ate a lot of food and nothing satisfied me. Finally, I stopped and asked my body, well, what would you kill for, right? What do you really want right now? And salad, lettuce came to mind. So I went to the fridge and I grabbed a romaine lettuce and I ate, you know, three pieces, three stalks, and I was stuffed, stuffed to the brim, could not take anything more. I don't think I ate for six or eight more hours. Whatever was in romaine lettuce was the thing that my body craved. And then it was like, okay, and you just ate enough for a while. So I just didn't eat for a lot more. I was so full. That is what eating for nutrition is like for your body. And we practice. Obviously, I'm still not good at it. Um, and sometimes we don't have the food available so that our body wants. So we have to kind of 
get get in this rhythm of figuring out with our body what we usually like and um good news is a lot of foods have a lot of the same nutrients so if you don't have one food it's not like an apple is the only absolute only thing that will cure this mm. there's a lot of things with magnesium or whatever else is in the apple right um so there often are other foods that your body can use um, for it your body's pretty flexible um, and especially as you are exposed to good food and you've cleaned up your taste buds, meaning you're not eating processed chemicals, you're not eating foods with MSG or things that come in a box, because those, by the way, all major food companies, like process, processed packaged food companies, all major food companies have a scientist that they hire to find chemicals that are edible that make you addicted to their particular brand of food. That is why you eat Doritos and the other off-brand of Doritos does not taste the same. There is a chemical that your body is asking for. Those chemicals get in the way of you craving a real nutrition that your body needs as opposed to an addictive substance that your body is, is, is circ circling for, right? Is in a cycle of. Um, yes. So MSG is a really well-known one that's in a lot of foods, but there are definitely specific addictive substances put in specific foods so that the Oreo tastes different than the Walmart knockoff brand. Um, or why people are addicted to Coke or um, you know Coca-Cola versus the Safeway Cola brand. Right? Um, a lot of the ingredients, if not all the ingredients, are probably the same except for that addictive property that you have. Um, so there's that. There are sugar and carbs. Eating a high processed sugar diet is also addicting. Um, people who have been addicted <laughs> yes, right, Dan, um, Deanna. Um, people who have been addicted to sugar and cocaine say that it is more difficult to kick the sugar craving than the cocaine craving. Um, one, because it's more widely available and it's in everything, so you're constantly getting little teasers. That's really hard. Um, but it is also physically, it affects us so much. Um, so, number one, you have to clean up your channels. This is why stopping processed food, this is why I love Whole30. It is not a sustainable, it doesn't have enough thought in it to really be a sustainable long-term diet, but it is great for 30 days, you know, you eat real food, you don't eat processed food, your taste buds get cleaned up, you understand that eating real food makes you feel different because you never tried that maybe before in your life. I love Whole30 for that. I absolutely love it. And going into a paleo or a Weston A. Price or something that is not very difficult once you understand where you're at from Whole30, but 30 days is very manageable. <laughs> so a lot of people will go there um, where they won't walk into a Weston A. Price lifestyle, which is very overwhelming to start with, for sure. Gaps also, um, depending on what you're coming from, totally overwhelming to do. Okay. Number one, we clean up our signals. Number two, you practice listening to your body and believe that it has good for you. Sometimes we don't believe our body has good for us. Sometimes we can just flip the switch and say, oh, you're right. I, you know, here's this example. I was hungry here, like my salad example. I was hungry. I listened to what my body needed and it was right. Great. Um, so you start logging those examples of when it worked well and realizing, oh, my body can be trusted. Some people have had more rocky experiences with their body, um, people with autoimmune disease or um, eating disorders or any semblance on that spectrum, um, depending on how you grew up. Some people's parents taught them unintentionally to have a very poor relationship with food. Um, maybe you have a severe zinc deficiency or had one, which you lose the taste for red meat and, and often become uh, a lot of anorexic people are very zinc deficient and it's probably what kind of started that spiral um like anorexic nervosa like actually anorexic um or any spectrum of that where you just you struggle with eating meat or eggs give you a headache or things like that so there's a lot of reasons why we have an incorrect uh, relationship a, a bad relationship with food or with our bodies and that is okay to take your time and work through that um and I, I'd love to talk to you. There's other people to talk to um, or just taking time with yourself. Every time you come up against a wall, think through it. Allow yourself to grieve hard things or things that you were taught or pushed on you that weren't true. Um, I've had a lot of grieving of 
just my body's inability to absorb for so long and how that affected my neurotransmitters were really affected and that affected a lot of things, including just not having a lot of pleasant memories growing up. Even though I did, had a great childhood, I just, I was not in a physical place because I felt so awful um, that I couldn't really just be joyful in a kid. And I've had to grieve that. So it's really important to allow that grief to happen because it happened. And then when we've been comforted, when we've acknowledged, then we're able to be in a different place um, or start to be um, in a different place and ask those questions. Um, yeah, I could talk forever on that too, but I, I will leave it at that. I think that's a good um, section of, of talking about that. So, so how do we know what foods to eat, right? So number one, we clean up our signals. Number two, we look for the nutrient-dense food. That's grown in soils that are alive. This is why it's great to buy grass-fed cow meat because often we've not treated the cow, uh, the, the grass where a cow is grazing. Um, and also most people who do grass-fed meat care a little about this and know at least some amount. So they're not heavily spraying. They're not using really toxic chemicals. They understand grazing rotation and things like that. So hopefully, um, if you get grass-fed, it's definitely going to be better. Um, a grass-fed meat, a pastured chicken, because they're pecking the bugs out of the ground because chickens are omnivores. They are not vegetarian. They love bugs. They love meat. Um, so uh, that's that. Eggs from chickens. Um, you know, so you've got that part. And then plants. Um, a little farmer, a little farmer, sorry, a farmer with a little farm um, that sells at your... Uh, what is it called? Farmer's market. There's a lot of farm in there. A little farmer, a farmer with a little farm selling at a farmer's market um, or a, a CSA. Like we have one here in Loveland, downtown Loveland, that they grow in people's backyards. Um, number one, you can manage the bugs better. Um, they don't use herbicides. They, they pick the bugs. Sometimes that's the job for the day is go pick all the, the cucumber squash off the plants, right? The squash bugs off the plant. So um, those types of things you can manage when you're in a small farm scale. So if possible, find and connect to that. Now, some CNA, CSAs go big scale, and they are using organic usually, but just because of the CSA does not mean that it is growing with a live soil. So ask some questions. Now you know what to ask. This is the point of today. What questions ask? Is the soil alive, right? That's what you're getting to. Is the soil alive? Do they understand what live soil means? And then do they understand live soil is important? Um, if they do, they're growing well. Maybe not perfectly well, but well. Okay, then you look at your own backyard, right? Growing food in your own garden is very helpful if that's possible. Here's the problem with hydroponics. Um, I, I looked into this, but I also mostly talked to some Weston A. Price chapter leaders, one in particular, about her thoughts, but there's no soil. So some of the natural ways that plants should absorb nutrition are uh, not there. And we also have to add nutrition to the water and it's usually a synthetically made nutrition and synthetic chemicals are less recognized and less usable by the plant and by our body when it comes through. So if all that plant has was synthetic magnesium, then all we can get is synthetic magnesium, right? And so hydroponics is actually not a great way to have nutrient-dense food. It's really cool, though, <laughs> but it's not a great way. Um, so growing little things that you can grow in whatever space you have is great. Finding a farmer, because they need support. Um, it is important to do, to do that, support them so they can continue in their practices. And voting with our dollars matters. It really does. Um, every action we have has a reaction, right? That's a lot of physics. So if you are voting with your dollars and supporting your farmer, even though you think I'm only one person buying for one person, like I just buy for me, there is a difference that's going to come into effect. Even though I probably can't see it, no number sheet is going to show whether I stop shopping at one store or the other. But if each of us do that, it is going to have an effect and you have control of you. So it will have an effect because it will move it will move it, even if it's imperceptible to most people looking at it. Okay, so clean up your signals, find dense food. Now you know some questions to ask. So questions to ask, number one question, check. 
Number two, how to know the density of your food. One, was it grown in a good place with a good practice? Um, preferably with animal and manure, but that's often illegal, unfortunately. We've made all the things illegal that are helpful for reasons, which we won't talk about here. Okay, um, number two, but I will rant with you anytime you want to stop by the office. Um, number two, uh, density of food. So how is it grown? But also what do your senses tell you? What is the color? What is the taste? What is the sound? What is the texture? Um, what is the smell, right? So you want to know those things. Um, and then benefits to ex uh, expect when you are eating dense food, one, eventually, maybe not immediately, but quickly, you will eat less food. I definitely eat less food than I used to in terms of portion size. Because I buy really dense steaks or lamb chops, I used to do two, three, two, three lamb chops, easy, right? And I can eat one usually because number one, my body is full. It doesn't need so much to keep going because it's not starving in behind. But number two, the lamb chop is grown on a farm with my friend with really dense um, grass, mostly, and some alfalfa hay grown on her dad's farm. This is a beautiful meat. Um, this is so dense with nutrition, and it is very filling, um, especially when it's the right thing that you want, right? It's the thing that your body wants. So what do you expect when you get more dense food? You have a more efficient body that feels well and is able to handle whatever comes at it, whether that's a stressful job or an illness or um, a, a scratch, right? Slow healing is nutritional deficiency. Um, even a broken or sprained bone or ankle, right? Um, those things, the building blocks you need to help fix that, you will be able to heal quickly because you have the available nutrition. Um, so that's really important to do. Okay, let's, the last thing I want to talk about, and jump in with questions if you have more, the last thing I want to talk about is um, some of the things I hinted at, but some of you look for like higher priorities to buying food, because a lot of us may not be able to switch our budget to um, buy the nutrient-dense food that we want, even if we get to eat less of it eventually. Right? I get it. Um, but we also want the best bang for our buck, right? It, and that's something that I'm very passionate about talking about. If you are eating for nutrition, not calories, eating a better quality food and buying a better quality food is in the long run cheaper, okay? The other way it's cheaper is because it saves in medical bills. So I really encourage people <clears throat> to put their food budget combined with their medical budget because you will see, especially if you are someone who is in the doctor's office a few times a year, you will see your medical budget go down because your food budget went up. Because if the body is able to handle whatever comes at it, you don't need a doctor very often. Um, you're going to do well checkups, you're going to spend money on food, um, and you are going to be well, pretty well, unless something really dramatic or urgent happens, which then we love modern medicine. It's so good. They are really good at emergencies. They have no idea how to deal with keeping a person well, um, or chronic health conditions, which is from not keeping a person well, and chemicals, and poor quality, and the fact that we believe calories equal health. So as we get into that, sorry, I'm sidebarring a lot. I'm actually fairly good. I was very sassy today, so I'm, I'm impressed at my refrain in not going off of tangents today. Take a drink of water. Okay, so when we start doing it, so number one, it is in the long run better. Number two, most of us do have money, but we have to see the value of what we are buying, rightly so. That is right. So jump into studying. Now, number three, or 2B, 2A, 2 subsection. Um, if you are spending a lot of money on really high quality chicken and your body wants steak, it will not make sense to you to spend money on high quality chicken because it's not the right thing. So part of learning what to buy or what to spend money on is also knowing what your body needs and what your family's body's needs are because then you will buy something that is helpful as opposed to something that is kind of helpful or it's still good quality but it's not what you want so you end up um, wasting it by not eating it or wasting it by not fully getting the benefit because it's not the right thing for you. Does that make sense? 
hopefully. So number one, it is cheaper in the long run. Number two, it's really cheaper if you look at medical bills and health costs like the cancers linked with glyphosate. Um, even with really good insurance, that will cost you not only money, but time and you know, energy, emotional energy, if you were to get cancer down the line. Like so much cost in that. Whereas um, doing something that's chemical free or less chemicals or feeding your detox system so they can get rid of the chemicals um, obviously has a much clearer benefit. So I firmly believe eating best quality food um, is the best decision you can make for your budget. I understand sometimes we have short-term places where we can't, like you have a family of four children and one income and you really literally can't. So we're gonna talk about what foods are denser or, and what to do that, so we'll do that next. If possible, long-term budget. If you don't believe that better food is better for you, maybe just do some more research. Read Empty Harvest, read Pottinger's Cats, read The Real Truth About Vitamins and anti Antioxidants. This is also on Celine River Press. Um, read Bechamp um, and Pasture, read Art of Fermentation. Right? All of these books that are about real nutrition, um, they are they, they are helpful to help you understand that there is value. Okay. <sighs> Number one, there's value, there's value. I belabored that point a million times. Number two, put it in your healthcare budget because it is. Um, okay, and then last thing is, here is kind of the the breakdown, just more information about what each type of food is. So number one, the most dense food on the planet is animal fat. If you can only afford to buy one really good thing, buy animal fat and buy as much of it as you need and your family needs to eat. No skimping. This is my passion. If you do not have vitamins A and D and some of the other activating factors in animal fat, you cannot absorb food that you eat or absorb it very efficiently. If you have enough vitamin A and D and other fat soluble activating factors, you will absorb more of your nutrition in your food by eating the exact same other food that you were eating. So if you add butter to everything or lard to everything or tallow to everything, you will get more nutrition from that food even if it's the only change that you make. And you will also get a lot of nutrition from fat because it's very calorically densely packed and it's very nutritionally densely packed. It's very important to get fat in good quality because fat is where we store toxins, right? That's why a lot of us have some tummy or, or hip fat. It's extra toxins our body hasn't been able to deal with. Animals will also store toxins in their fat. So if you have an animal that was raised inside, fed crappy food its whole life, that fat while still having some nutrients and still better than nothing, it's most important to spend your money on a really good quality fat. So number one, grass fed in the sunshine. If it's lard, it needs to be pigs that are in the ground because they have microbia that are gonna break down toxins. So we don't have the same toxic issues with pigs not being able to sweat. Um, if it's raised like a pig should be, which is snout in the ground from birth, from the day of birth, okay. Um, okay, fat. What else do you want to say about fat? It's important. There are also some dense things like fermented cauliflower oil. Green Pastures I like, Rosita also. Both are the only two brands that don't add synthetic vitamins, which I don't like, obviously. Um, so those two I would recommend. High uh, concentrated butter oil. High con concentrated butter oils, now that they call it, they changed it. So fermented cauliflower oil with concentrated butter oil from Green Pastures is excellent in absorption of nutrients and dense, dense nutrition for your body, for your stress system. Our bodies are stressed in our world all the time, not only from toxins, but also from emotional stressors and Facebook and blah, -de blah, -de blah, like so much stress our body is dealing with all the time. We need a lot of minerals and we need a lot of fat. And we don't eat fat because we're not allowed to, according to the heart healthy you know, recommendations, which are based on false science um, and completely disproven, but you know, a lot of people don't. And then we don't eat minerals because minerals are only found in proper proportions in a well-balanced alive soil. So all of the vegetables where we're supposed to get our minerals from are very mm -hmm. mineral deficient um, comparatively. Other sidebar, sorry, I forgot to mention this earlier. The uh, RDA or the the readout of like what's in a carrot, right? You can look up how much vitamin A in a carrot and it tells you. 
The RDA for that, sorry, my puppy is snoring. The RDA for that carrot is from one test about, well, sometime in the 50s or 60s, I think. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but they tested all the food and then they were like, that's what it is. We do not have that amount of nutrition in the carrots that you eat today. Um, maybe if you grow it yourself or you have a, a farmer who's been doing beautiful growing practices, but the average carrot that you buy in the store, organic or not, does not have the same nutrition that that is listing. So just FYI. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm getting off track. I'm getting excited now. First, we have the fat. Most important to get well. Good quality, good fat. Um, second one is going to be meat because of the density. So uh, this is going to concentrate density. It's also a lot easier to raise good quality meat than it is to raise good quality vegetables because we've depleted our soil so badly. The cow eats a lot of grass to concentrate the minerals and vitamins into our body um, or into its body so that we can then eat that concentrated into our body. Uh, they have four stomachs and tons of microbes working for them to get the most out of the vegetation they're eating. So that is why meat is more dense. Um, it's better to eat and important to get like some pasture. It needs to be in the sun, it needs to be eating grass. If it has some grain, like if you can't quite get the grass finished one because it's $10 more expensive a pound or something, um, I know that's a lot, but, um, then, you know, get the one that's the best, right? So meat can be a little flexible in that because it does have a detoxification system and it does have a concentration system. So meat's going to concentrate nutrition for you. And it's also, if it has functional liver and kidneys and lungs, it's going to detoxify a lot of the chemicals that it ate in its lifetime. Plants can't detoxify. So Meat is helpful to have good quality because it gives you more in terms of building blocks if you have to rebuild your body. But vegetables will hold on to, and plants, plants will hold on to chemicals and can't really get rid of them very well. So that is going to be actually more important to buy organic, which is great because that's actually a cheaper up, right? So you buy really good quality fat and you switch to um, organic or hopefully farm-raised produce as much as possible. Other hacks in there, fermenting. Fermenting a, a vegetable will increase the nutritional availability because the little bacteria go to work pulling off the nutrients, nutrients and putting them in the water, um, right, into the brine, and just breaking down the fibers and everything so that when you go to eat it, it's actually a lot easier for your body to digest and absorb all the nutrition that was bound to a fiber of the cabbage or whatever. So fermenting is huge. Fermenting will also process toxins because one of the job of good microbes is to break down or bind to toxins. So if you have to, if you can't get organic produce, ferment your produce. Now, the toxins in the, in the produce may actually kill your ferment and not allow it to grow then you know you should not be eating it. If it kills your microbes that you're trying to ferment with, please do not eat that thing. It is not safe for consumption or for life, right? It's not safe for life. But for a lot of times they can overcome it, so that is something to do. There is also something called a clean 15 and a dirty dozen list. You can look those up. They are clean 15 is the 15 cleanest foods, meaning the non-organic foods had very little or to no traces of pesticides in them, and they will tell you about them. Avocados are top of the list. Um, for a long time, the growing practices are changing in Mexico, but for a long time, you don't need to put pesticides on avocado trees, they're fine. So most avocados, organic or not, are fine in terms of pesticide count. Now, you guys know more, you guys now know the deeper level, which is organic, does not equal nutritional density. It can, but it doesn't necessarily. So you wanna look at that too. Okay, clean 15. Um, so those ones are okay, um, like avocados. I will buy organic if I'm a natural grocer because that's all they have, but I will often buy conventional <coughs> avocados because it does save sometimes a dollar a piece, right? Or $2 a piece. Oh, there's so much to talk about with this. Okay. Um, so clean 15, dirty dozen. I absolutely recommend for everyone, 
do not eat foods on the Dirty Dozen list. If you cannot buy organic foods of the versions on the Dirty Dozen list, just don't eat them. Um, I probably eat four or five berries a year that are not organic at a party. Once in a while, it's just like, I'm just going to, I just need something or I just want something and I'll eat a couple raspberries or something, but I, I will not eat berries because berries are hugely um, pesticide ridden. Um, grapes, there's one time I heard they tested a single grape contained 72 different pesticide chemicals. These are not things that are okay in our body. So if you can't afford the organic version of certain things, like berries are expensive, just find something else to eat except those rare treats. So that's kind of how I operate my life. You, do, you can do what you want, but that's my recommendation. So clean 15, probably okay, especially if you're fermenting it. So things like onions, um, garlic maybe is on there, maybe cabbage, oranges, can't remember the list off the top of my head. And then dirty dozen, avoid like the plague unless you can buy organic or from a farmer. Now, if you're buying from a farmer that's not certified organic, you but you talk to them and they have live soil and they know live soil is important so they're not spraying pesticides, you're good. That's better than organic. And then biodynamic um, or Joe Salatin also, those are words you may find people saying, and they are doing the grazing rotation, understand that they need live soil, how to build top soil, how to use animals to make your plant growth better and more nutrient dense. So biodynamic farming, Joe Salatin is one of the head guys for that. Um, so that's what you want to look for if you are wanting to go beyond organic, um, or if you're needing to purchase something, um, there are farms um, that will, Polyface Farm is Joe, Joe Salatin's, that will package and ship potentially, um, depending on where you live, to you. So you could buy um, biodynamically grown produce if you don't have any option where you are and have it delivered to your door. So that's really helpful. Okay. Um, covered vegetables and fruit, um, covered meat, covered fat. Those are the main things. Grains. Let's talk about grains. So let's say you tolerate grains. Okay, you really do because some people do. Gluten grains, especially American gluten, is very different um, than a different kind. The other thing I want to talk about in this category is corn. So 90, I don't know, a high percentage of corn is called Roundup Ready corn. This is corn that's been genetically modified. Um, Sometimes more than others, like it could be a hybrid, but genetically modified um, to receive Roundup. And that, so when they harvest corn in a big field, they have to harvest it at the same time. So when the corn gets ripe, what they do is they spray Roundup on the corn and all of the corn stalks die. And then they pull those corn stalks out, they take the corn and they process it. And that is where we get 80 to 90 plus percent of the corn in our country is that Roundup Ready corn. Usually it's not rained. Um, that Roundup is literally on the corn when they harvest it. Um, there is great debate about when it breaks down. Um, the people that say that it breaks down within a few hours or as soon as it touches the soil um, are the companies that have vested interest in financial profit from this being okay. Um, other studies are showing that that is less true, including the lawsuit that was won um, against Monsanto about Roundup and the guy who got cancer. Right. So, which was just upheld in a higher court the last couple of days I saw in articles. So, hooray in that. The, the ruling that it did cause cancer was upheld. Hooray. Okay, I digress. Corn, grains. Grains um, can be hybridized because it's convenient. Um, we want to have more yield. So a lot of American gluten, why it's so different is because they have hybridized it to have a fuller head of, and bigger, bigger kernels um, per stock, which of course is better, right? American better. <laughs> um, that grain is much more glutinous, um, is a, a bigger molecule, so it's a lot harder to break down than an heirloom grain of gluten like einkorn. So be aware of that. Um, so that is so much I know, Deb. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't look into corn, don't look into canola oil if you ever want to eat them again. 
Oh, oils, plant oils, high heated plant oils do not count as food. Stop, don't eat them. Um, canola oil is a byproduct of processing. Um, they use margarine to fatten turkeys, and then they tell us to eat it to lose weight. The heart healthy, low fat things are canola oil margarine, which is literally what they use to fatten turkeys. So use the oils and don't use oils unless they're cold pressed, really beautiful oils. Use fats found in nature like, you know, lamb fat and pork fat and butter. Okay, I don't know why I got off on that tangent, but that was important to say, don't eat canola oil um, or any high heat processed oils. Okay. Um, oh, einkorn flour. So. A lot of people, you've heard this probably, people go to Europe and say, I could eat everything there. I could eat their pastas and their breads. That's because they use different gluten flour than we do. Our, our wheat gluten is so big and so difficult for our, our bodies to digest that often it can't. Um, gluten that's not digested will tear apart the gut junctions and cause leaky gut in all of us when we eat it. But oftentimes, um, for people who don't have issues with gluten, it, it pulls them apart and the body seals them back up and it's not a big deal. Um, the body is constantly ebbing and flowing and things like that. When we have huge amounts of gluten without nutrition, by the way, because there's very little nutrition when you go high carbohydrates. Um, so when you have that, then we're going to have lots of um, issues um, with that. More leaky gut issues, more things like that. Um, if you are tolerating grains, then eat an heirloom grain, eat sourdough grains, soak your grains, sprout your grains, look at nourishing traditions, way of properly preparing grains. Grains. I have a video of why properly prepare grains you can find on this channel. So look at those different things and do that. If you are not tolerating grains, be honest with yourself and give yourself a break. Maybe do rice with meat stock, that's usually the easiest one. Get organic corn. Um, that's stone ground with lye because that actually properly, it's called nixtamalization. Um, that properly digests the corn. So it's properly prepared and digestible, available to you. The nutritional studies of a nixtamalized corn versus a non, um, non-prepared corn are astronomically different in the amount of nutrition that you get from a nixtamalized corn. It's actually not a bad source of nutrition if you prepare it properly. So um, and you can buy nixtamalized corn chips. Actually, there's a couple brands that sell them. So it's pretty, pretty cool to learn these little things. There's lots of data. I've been doing this for a lot of years as my full-time job now. So I know a lot. I'm happy to do that. Um, any specific foods that people have questions about? Did I miss a category? Um, any other questions that came up or things you wish I had talked about? I'm pretty much done with my, my notes. Give you guys a minute. Um, I love to teach and I like this platform because this is shareable. So please do share this with people, send this to people. This will be available as a live uh, a replay. Um, we will be talking next week about hormone balance. So don't miss that. Um, 6.30 next week. Um, and then we're going to go to 7. But 6.30 next week um, on YouTube Live. We're figuring out what we want to do for June topics. Let me know if you have a topic you want me to talk about because we haven't planned all our June classes yet. Um, if you want to support our educational endeavors, you can go to bewellclinic.net slash events, and there is a donate button that you can put in some dollar amount and send to us, or you can send us a check, uh, whatever works for you. That just helps me to be able to keep teaching. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's a great thing um, if, that, if you feel like you want to. Appreciate it. Okay, if you're sensitive to gluten or wheat, can you eat sourdough and sprout it? Sometimes, yes. So if you have fermented your sourdough 24 plus hours, the gluten is um, broken down. It doesn't exist as a protein of gluten anymore. And a lot of celiac people can eat that. The problem is um, sprouted wouldn't do it because sprouted would still have the gluten there. So you would not have the uh, anti-nutrients attacking your body, but you would still have the gluten molecule present that your body still has to break down. So it depends on what degree you are. Um, a sprouted sourdough bread would be pretty great. Um, and then there's a lot of gluten-free grains like buckwheat, for example, that you could do. Um, but most, a lot of people can do a uh, normal white flour, long fermented sourdough bread, even if they can't eat other gluten. 
The other thing that happens when we eat grains is that our flora eats the, the carb, um, especially if it hasn't broken down. That flora could be bad, and so you could be seeing symptoms if you're not tolerating a, a grain. You could be seeing symptoms of your gut flora that's uh, opportunistic, meaning not good for you, um, eating that carb and causing symptoms from releasing different chemicals in the byproduct of its eating process. So bloating, for example, when you bloat after eating bread, that's actually probably a gut flora issue, not a gluten sensitivity necessarily. Um, it's a whole nother topic again, but great question. Hopefully that helps. So potentially, yes, you also still have to address your flora. Um, but the more broken down that bread is, the less, the more quickly you can absorb it and the less it hangs out in your gut feeding your flora, especially if you had bad flora, that's not a good plan. All right. Well, thank you guys for participating. It's so helpful to me to have people in live chat um, interacting and asking questions. Makes me feel like I'm not just talking to a camera because I pretty much am. Um, but I know that you're there and that is awesome. Um, I will kind of hang out for a second to see if there's any more questions that come in. But if not, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for supporting me just by being here. Um, supporting us if you want to do the donate button. We appreciate that. And um, yeah, let me know some topics if you have some. Um, you can put them in the comments below. I'm going to keep making videos even if we go back to some live classes. Hopefully, eventually, we will go back to live classes. Um, but, yeah, that is awesome. You are welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. Okay. Well, you guys have a great night um, or great whenever you watch this on replay, everyone. And I will see you for the next one. Have a good time.